Welcome everybody, welcome to Health and Hope. Uh, this is February 20th, is that right? Can't believe that we're already getting all the way through February and again, we have another beautiful night outside. Uh, but we're in here and we're gonna learn about um, how to get healthy, how to stay healthy, how to um, become the best version of ourselves that we can be. So I wanted to start with another story. Everybody seems to be loving the stories. And so this is a story I recorded uh, a couple weeks ago. This is Gary and Leslie Briggs. Um, well, we both retired recently. I, I've been three years, five years. So as retired people, you get to go out to lunch and everything. And we're in our early 60s. And we, you know, started putting on pound. Then the COVID hit. Mm. <laughs> and we found ourselves uh, snacking every night, having like a glass of wine every night so gradually and you get on the scale and you said whoa 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 uh so we kept on saying something needs to be done something needs to be done gary would say it then i would say it so we started working out and uh that seemed to tone but the weight was really not coming off so uh we heard about this uh we heard that Mylon was doing this and we said, okay, I go really, we have to invest and get a coach. Cause obviously what we're doing, we're trying to eat healthy. Mm -hmm. We're um, going to the gym. I go, but we're missing some, something's not, you know, uh, working. So anyway, so long story, story short, we, we uh, reached out to Mylon. It sounded like a good program. We go, well, let's give it a try. And um, we were so happy with the results right away. We started November 7th, and on 77 days later, I hit my goal weight. And that, like she said, that was through Thanksgiving, Christmas. We had family here for two and a half weeks. Uh, and, and so we had Thanksgiving, Christmas, and that Hawaiian vacation. Even with all those hurdles, I'm down 20, almost 27 pounds, and you're down. Wow. A little over 30. Yeah. A little over 30 wow. at this point. I mean, it, I would say it's easy, but you, there is work to do with it. But it, but yeah. it's easy if you just stick with the program. I think we've got, definitely got more energy. Yeah, um, I just cut out, out my naps. I'm kind of sad. <laughs> I love napping, but I, I don't know if we've taken a nap. No, Maybe just like two. Since just don't feel, started. just don't feel the need to it, really. Well, and Leslie, you looked great in that red dress. I know you wanted to get oh, back in that red dress, and yes. uh, I'm sure Gary, you yeah. like to see her in that red dress, yeah, don't you? you uh, I, I, got, I got to help zip it up, so that was a good thing. <laughs> there you go. Nice, <laughs> nice. I didn't like the idea of really having to buy the foods. Mm -hmm. and uh, uh, But but after talking with you, Mylon, and then, and then doing the math, I mean, I, we think we're probably even spending less right now. The one thing that I've been doing is I've been listening to those weekly the elements I've been I've been listening to those when I when I go to the gym and then that original the first book that that first ebook when we first started the program was very helpful too it just really opened up and and it gave me a, a more of an understanding of what we're trying to do here not just the fact of not just the fact of um, not, not just the fact of trying to lose weight and yeah. there's way more to it than just just yeah, losing the whole big weight picture. just the fact that feeling better looking better uh, and and. Yeah, I, I, it was hard to believe that I was I could lose 30 pounds, that I needed to lose 30 pounds, and it's turned out to be a, it's really turned out to be a blessing for sure. All right, so that's just a little bit of inspiration, encouragement. Again, that's part of the reason that we do these health and hope events. When you come, we want you to be able to to remember why you're on this journey and to see other people's story and to be excited about that. So tonight we are going to talk about optimizing our surroundings. This is element number five. And um, so we're just going to talk about what it means to optimize our surroundings. Does anybody remember um, what we talked about last week? Can you share um, something that you remember from last week? <laughs> we talked about above the line thinking and below the line thinking. Does anybody remember yes. the difference between those? It was above the line thinking is open, it's positive, it's, you know, filled with positivity, it's life-giving. Um, below the line thinking is often negative and it's, and it's uh, defensive and those kinds of things. And those have a lot to do with our stress. Uh, stress creates cortisol and our mind puts cortisol in our system. It's a, um, 
Uh, it's a chemical that, that our body, and, and what that does is it tells our system to actually hold on to um, fat and to, to store fat. And so a lot of times just the stress level of negativity and all of that um, can have a big effect on us. So we really want to get to the point where we are doing more above the line um, kind of thinking and reacting. And so we're going we're gonna to revisit that tonight. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, oh, the other thing uh, from last week that we talked about was the drama triangle. Staying out of the drama triangle and getting into the empowerment triangle um, and just managing our relationships um, with other people. Actually, our emotions related to other people a little bit differently. But tonight, we're going to go into a little bit more of uh, how to optimize our surroundings, and a lot of this is relational as well. Um, so, Dr. Anderson in the book says this, uh, your goal is to create a microenvironment of health, a protective bubble to shield you against the obesogenic forces and nurture your growth uh, and transformation. So um, the idea behind this whole thing is that to some degree, we've got to create some kind of bubble around ourselves. In other words, we have the opportunity to impact the things that are around us. Now, we don't have control. This isn't about control, but it is about using our agency to be able to um, maximize our environment, the relationships around us, the people around us, the things, the events, um, and in so doing, create a more healthy environment, at least a place that's gonna be um, more proactive uh, at helping us to develop the kind of healthy lifestyle that we desire. And remember, and this is, a, this is just a reminder that um, in a lot of ways, we have, um, a lot of people losing weight and having really good success with a weight loss program. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think all of us want a sustainably healthy lifestyle, something that after we've reached a goal weight, um, will continue for the rest of our lives. And so in order to do that, we've got to begin to get intentional about creating our new story. And that intentionality is what this whole thing is all about. Um, we can be, have all the intentionality in the world. If we don't have the tools, we can't do it. So. I want to give you the tools so that you can be intentional about creating your new story. So we are, again, this is another quote out of the life book. We are hardwired to be social. Uh, I would say that God created us to be social. Uh, I think that's probably one of the reasons why I love the Lord with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself is the greatest commandment because God wired us to be social. He wired us to be in relationship. It's not something that's kind of like, Eh, that's an option. Uh, it's a part of who we are. We're designed for that. So we're hardwired to be social, and our sense of connection, belonging, and attachment to other people is one of the most fundamental of human needs. So it's not just, again, some kind of option that's out there, but it's actually part of what we need as human beings. In order to be healthy, we need relationship. We need connection. And this connection only, uh, not only serves us on our journey to health and well-being, but it's essential for living lo a longer, healthier life. We know that people, uh, literally their life is affected by their level of loneliness. Some people may live a shorter life and may not experience um, some areas of health if they don't have good relationships. So the first thing that we want to do is we want to manage the dynamics of our current relationships. Last week we talked about more of our internal um, emotions. This week I want to talk a little bit more about managing the dynamics of our current relationships. And again, we've got to start with that question in our relationships with others. Are we living above the line or below the line? Are we living with positivity? Um, are we living um, in ways that are helpful and supportive of others in our relationships? Um, or are we defensive and, and negative? So uh, in the book, it talks about um, the hot or go system. The hot or go system is um, part of that um, below the line thinking. Now the hot or go system is uh, based on um, instincts that we had back in the day when saber-toothed tigers roamed the earth, <laughs> and uh, our environment was actually a lot more dangerous back in those days. We think it's dangerous now with cars and all that kind of stuff, um, but actually human beings had to have other ways to survive, 
And so in a lot of ways, we were wired to respond to stimuli in our environment, uh, especially negative stimuli, in a way that we would, we would go. We'd, our, our emotions would get hot and we would go. In other words, when a saber-toothed tiger is coming, you don't have time to think about it. <laughs> you need to run, right? Well, what's interesting is that we don't have those same kind of dangers in the same kind of ways. Right? Now, there are plenty of dangers in the world. Obviously, none of us are going to live forever uh, on this planet. But um, we don't find ourselves in physical danger very often. It's rare that we need to be able to exercise that. So what he's saying is that we need to access our cool or no system instead of our hot and go system. Our hot and go system is based on reflex and instinct. Our cool or no system is that, uh, that system that slows us down to kind of think about our situation and process it and use the wisdom that we have and the things that we know to come up with better solutions um, for stress. Part of what we have to come to terms with is a realization that most of the uh, stressors or most of the threats that we feel now are really threats to our ego. And a lot of times we feel threatened because somebody says something negative about us or somebody treats us unfairly, or somebody, you know, gossips uh, behind our back. Those are the kinds of threats that cause us oftentimes to respond with the hot and go system. In other words, somebody does something we don't like, immediately our temperature rises and we go. I mean, we go to, we go to work, right? And we respond in very negative, uh, closed, defensive ways, and we can really hurt relationships when we do that. What he's saying is we need to learn how to pause and how to use the gifts and skills that we learn relationally to handle those situations better. Because the truth is, even if somebody is treating us unfairly, it's very unlikely that we're physically in danger. Now that happens, obviously, we know that. But it's pretty rare. Most of the time, it's better for us to keep our cool and to use what we know to respond better. So he says, check yourself before you wreck yourself. <laughs> Last week, um, we talked about stop, challenge, and choose. We're going we're gonna to unpack that a little bit more tonight. Um, and really, that starts with this whole concept of pausing, checking ourselves before we wreck ourselves. So let's look at how the stop, challenge, and choose works in, uh, in relationships, okay? So the first thing we need to do is stop. When we feel tension, we need to be aware of breathing, heart rate, um, our gut responses. I think uh, one of the things that we struggle with is that we're not real aware. Because we do the hot or go response, right? That doesn't take any awareness. You did me wrong, I'm coming after you, or I'm running away, right? But um, what we want to do is stop, be aware of those emotional responses. Then um, we could take a drink before speaking. I'm not talking about that kind of drink. <laughs> I'm talking about like a drink of water, okay? Um, but we, uh, we know that hydration is an important part of our health. We should be carrying water with us or there should be water close by all the time anyway. And this may be a good time to take a drink of water um, before we speak or before we spot off. All right, so um, we can also consider the relational consequences. It's important for us in this pause to consider how is my response gonna affect this relationship? Uh, another thing that I think in our current culture, we don't think ahead. We don't think about what are the consequences? Where is this gonna lead um, my response? Um, and, and not only how it will affect your relationship with that other person, but your relationship with yourself. How often do we do we do that hot or go response? And later on we think, oh my gosh, what have I done? Why did I say that? Why did I do that? Um, now I gotta try to fix that and I gotta clean up that. And so we need to consider the relational consequences. Sometimes we can just simply count to 10, uh, just pausing long enough to take some deep breaths. Sometimes we need to sleep on it. Uh, maybe we need to wait till tomorrow to address the situation. Give it a little bit of time. Now, does that mean we go to bed angry? No, 
But it does mean that we go to bed at least processing, thinking about it, trying to figure out how to handle a situation the best. Of course, when, during our stop, we need to be open and curious to deeply understand the situation. Not just what they did, not just our perception of it, right? But there's something about being open and curious that says, I'm, and, and there's, there's something humble about saying, I don't know everything. Before I respond, I better make sure I understand. And that requires a certain level of curiosity. All right? Um, exercising an attitude of gratitude daily. And, and this is more uh, of a maintenance thing. This is not necessarily what you do when you uh, uh, encounter a situation like this. Um, but this is more about just um, putting ourselves in a mindset, in a disposition, where we are more uh, likely to respond positively in a situation. If we go through our day being thankful and grateful and positive, um, and we exercise that attitude of gra gratitude on a daily uh, basis, then we're going to have a better disposition. I think a lot of times the reason we respond the way that we do is we're kind of in a negative bent already, right? And then when somebody triggers us, then we go off. So we need to work on being positive, having a positive disposition every day. Uh, another idea is to pray. And um, that is that can be a powerful moment. And um, our prayer is not just, um, Lord, help me to, to throw this just right so it hits him in the middle of the head. Um, but prayer for help for the situation. But more than that, for God to shape our heart and our attitudes with kindness and generosity and patience. Uh, Lord, give me wisdom. Help me to see this, per this situation from your perspective. Help me to see this person through your eyes. Um, this should probably be at the top of the list. Because when we, when we give ourselves over to God and we say, God, I'm, I'm asking you for your help, that has a huge impact. Of course, referring to the scriptures, very similar to prayer, but it's that, it's that idea of accessing truth that's higher than my current truth. We live in a world where everybody says, I've got my truth, and that's all that matters. Um, our truths are broken, and our truths are faulty, and our truths are incomplete. And the, the truth of Scripture will help us to understand our situation with clarity and with power. So this stopping should give us an opportunity to exercise these things that will prepare us to deal with the situation. Now, when we stop, we also have to challenge. Once we've stopped, we challenge. Challenge the relationships in your life and the dynamics of those relationships. Observe their effects. Identify the relationships that are serving you and those that are pulling you away from your goals. So, even in a conflict situation, we have a relationship with the person that we're in conflict, right? I need to observe that relationship. I need to challenge the dynamics of it. Where have I been out of line? How might I have contributed to this problem, right? And then look at the relationship itself. How is this relationship serving my goals and moving me in the right direction? Now, that doesn't mean take a selfish position on it, but we do have to challenge those relationships and see if the relationship itself in this situation is pulling me away from my goals and my response to it. And then we need to choose. Choose how we will make adjustments necessary to create a healthier environment. In this situation, if I'm conflicted, if somebody comes against me, what am I going to do to create a healthier environment moving forward? Again, it goes back to if we respond with the hot or go kind of response, then we may actually create more problem. We may create more relational um, issues that we have to deal with. So we make intentional plans that will minimize the relationships and environments that erode and maximize the relationships and environments that build. Remember last week, um, we asked the question, who's responsible for your current health condition? We are. Uh, it's easy in relational issues or relational problems to be able to say, well, of course, it's that person. They just did this. But again, when we stop, challenge, and choose, we are taking responsibility for the relationship, and we are choosing outcomes. We are choosing directions. We are choosing responses. So the next thing that we can look at 
is um, becoming aware of those who are friends and those who are accomplices. What's the difference between friends and accomplices? What do you guys think? Enabling some accomplice will enable you to continue whatever behavior you want to have yeah. done. Or, or, or maybe even a behavior you don't want to, but if there's enough temptation present, <laughs> we'll fall into, right? They'll help you, would you say excuse? Yeah. Yep. Right. Accomplices may be the one who's putting whatever that is in front of you, right? Yeah. Easier to live that way if you abide by me. Yeah. Well, let's talk about friends. What What are the things that define a true friend? A true friend will be honest with you. Yep. Doesn't judge you. Just helps support uh, the truth in you. Or, you know, yeah. Not support every little thing, but. Yeah. Yep. Challenge you to be the best yeah. you. Challenge you. To Challenge you to be the best you. Yep. Good. Yeah. What's that, Mary? Ooh, tell you when you're wrong, hold you accountable. Absolutely, a true friend will say what's difficult to say that needs to be said. In a kind way. Yeah, and a lot of times a friend will care enough about you to understand what's best for you and what you want. They, they know your goals and they care about your goals. If you go into a situation where uh, you're with people who are, are not true friends, um, they, they've got their own agenda. We're here to have fun, right? And you're sticking to mud, you're causing problems. And they care more about their experience in that situation uh, than they care about you and your story and your future and what you're trying to accomplish. So we need to become discerning. We need to understand the difference between friends and accomplices. When we talk about creating this micro environment around us, this bubble, um, or you know, managing the, the environment around us, that means that we're gonna be intentional about the individuals that are gonna get our attention. Now, that gets a little sticky because we are to love everyone, right? Um, but again, going to the drama triangle, that doesn't mean that we have to allow anybody and everybody into our lives. Um, that means that at times we have to be wise about setting up the right boundaries, creating spaces between us and other people, not intended to push them away, but intended to give us room to do the right things um, and pursue the right goals and, um, and, and be the person that we want to be. So your decision to stay above the line to respond in a rational way to someone else's below the line behavior is a huge step in improving your relationships. So that might be something that you want to actually look at this week if you have somebody in your life that is encouraging, an accomplice who's encouraging below the line behavior, or maybe they're approaching you with below the line behavior. We have a tendency to mirror, don't we? Mm -hmm. Right? So when somebody else does something, whether good or bad, we mirror that. And so one of the things that we have to work on is there will always be people in our lives who will exhibit below the line behavior. And how are we going to respond to that? Are we going to mirror it? Or are we going to say, nope, I'm choosing, I'm stepping out of that drama triangle. I'm choosing empowerment. And I'm going to handle this situation and this relationship differently. Okay? Um, one last note, uh, being open and curious and wanting to other, understand others in conflict situations is a powerful demonstration of respect and honor. Not only do we have to be aware of how other people are being, but we also, we have an opportunity to mirror the things that we want others to be able to, to be toward us. So that whole, again, a scripture, um, do unto others as you would have them to do unto you, right? So we could set the example. We can set the tone. We can create spaces where we're building the environment around us by doing the right thing and then giving others an opportunity to respond as well. All right. So we've talked about relationships. Let's talk a little bit about, and this still involves relationships a little bit, but more the content of our sphere of influence. We want to manage the contents of our sphere of influence. And this is going to uh, require that we learn how to avoid traps, right? Again, the stop, 
challenge and choose. And here are some of the traps that we need to learn how to avoid. Situations. This is probably one of the biggest things that as I'm coaching people is coming back to me. Situations. These are events where unhealthy behaviors are encouraged. This is like the birthday party where the people are saying, oh, come on, it's just a piece of cake. You could do a piece of cake. There's nothing wrong with a piece of cake. We have to be prepared, right, to handle those situations. We have to be prepared. Uh, actually, let's, let's take some time and um, let's process through some of that, right? Um, in a situation like that, how should we or how could we respond? What's a good way if somebody comes to you at a birthday party? You're at a birthday party. Everybody expects there's going to be cake and ice cream, right? But that's not your lifestyle. And that's not where you're at. So how are you going to respond? No, I don't want any. Well, that ain't true. take it to go and throw it away on the way out. Okay. I, I mean, if it's pressured, you know, sure. a little kid comes up and to ask you, I mean. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you very much. You could still be very kind, right? Thank you. And then you can turn around and, okay. I, I think it depends, but you could let them know ahead of time. My mom is, I, you know, I'm not eating any sweets, so I yeah. just want to give you a heads up that I won't be having anything. So Great idea. And I appreciate that if somebody's coming to my house and tell me. Sure. I don't over do something or just have all carbs yeah, yeah. or whatever. Yeah, so, I mean, especially with something like Thanksgiving or Christmas, some kind of family something. holiday celebration, right, to be able to let somebody know in advance, hey, by the way, I just want you to know this is not an in-the-moment thing. This is where I'm at and prepare them. Okay, what else? Just let them know that you feel like you're, you realize you're healthy, not as healthy as you need to be. Maybe you're having... Uh, some joint pain, and that you're just, right now, you're, I'm just not eating any sugar. Yeah. So, you have a reason why. Yeah, think about it like this. If you access your why for them, right, that helps them to understand. And most people will identify with that. If you just say, I don't want any, well, that kind of leaves it wide open. Well, why not? What, that's, that can be taken offensive. But if you simply are able to be able to share your why and say, well, here's where I'm at. And this is why I'm making some lifestyle changes. And one of those lifestyle changes is this. I really just need you to respect that. Can you do that? Um, I think it'd be pretty hard to get offended at that unless the other person sees you doing something that they wish they were doing yeah. at the end of the day and they don't have. But you got to remember in the moment they may be offended. They may feel that way, but you're going to be setting a good example for them. And hopefully down the road, Maybe that can help them to be able to make a similar kind of decision. They may think about that later and go, yeah. this person is really taking their health seriously. I mean, that's something I want to do. So what did you find that's motivated you to do this, right? Mm -hmm. And it invites them in. Mm -hmm. All right. Very good. Relationships. We've already talked about relationships a little bit, but people whose primary connection always revolves around the thing that you are needing to avoid. Um, so when I was a youth pastor, I often had to have a conversation with a young man or a young woman about, hey, your friends that are always wanting you to do this thing, they're going to take you down a wrong road, and it's not good. You need to make some big decisions about that. Um, I know that alcohol is one of those things. There are certain people where when I'm around them, alcohol is just part of the equation. There's just no way around it. You, that may be an area where you have to really think about um, the kind of boundaries that you have to put in place if that's a weakness um, that's going to be a problem for your environment, right? Um, same thing with sweets and sugars. And it may be your sweet old grandma, <laughs> you know, or whatever. Um, but at some, you know, at some point, you've got to say, okay, what can I put into that relationship or that situation then to create a healthy boundary? And it may be when I go over there, I ask beforehand, can you please not offer me these things. These are not helpful for me. They're there and, and I'm avoiding them. And so I need your help with this. So um, places, right? Like a bar for an alcoholic, 
a place. Um, alcoholics would say, I just can't go to the bar anymore. I just can't do it. I got to make sure that I put that healthy decision, that healthy boundary in there. And so there may be places where you go um, that are going to create unhealthy temptations for you. Um, other triggers, I guess that could go back to the habits, um, but certain foods that are still present in the home. Uh, you got to ask yourself, what is your kryptonite? So as you move forward um, in this journey, you will fail. We all fail, right? And that's okay. We don't want to shame ourselves and we don't want to make it a big deal, but we do have to get smart about it. And when we fail, we've got to stop and we've got to go, okay, what is it about that or the surrounding situation or my environment or whatever? What can I do to change my relationship with that thing? What can I do to put myself in a position where I'm stronger with that temptation? And so we've got to look at our triggers and we've got to understand that we have to take control of those things. We're responsible for our health. We cannot expect other people to take responsibility for those things. Um, we can't blame those things for our situation because ultimately at the end of the day, we're the one that moves the food <laughs> into our mouth. We've got to take responsibility for those triggers and we've got to do what needs to be done. Dr. A says that having like-minded people around you becomes a powerful motivator. This is all about community. This is why, this is one of the main reasons that we do this whole health and hope thing. So that there's a place for people to come together, like-minded people, to be motivated, to be strengthened, to move in the right direction. Have you ever gotten into a hobby or developed an interest in something just because you got connected with somebody with that interest? I remember when I was in middle school, Dwayne Blackport was a bird watcher. Dad, you knew where I was going with that, didn't you? <laughs> and in middle school, I got into bird watching. What a weird thing for a middle schooler to get into. Well, my best buddy was into bird watching. So I'd go over to his house and he, him and his dad and their family were totally into it. And pretty soon I'm bird watching. And it was just like a weird thing, but actually it's kind of cool. Um, now that I'm older, it's more cool than when I was in college. But um, my, uh, my best friend in high school, Matt Thorne, uh, was totally into airplanes and so for a couple of years, every time we got together, we'd talk about airplanes. I learned all of the different, you know, fighter jets and all the different stuff. And that was just an interest that developed because of a connection. What if we created that kind of connection for people? What if we said, I believe in the, the body that God has given me and my responsibility to take good care of it. And I think this body can do amazing things and it can help me to experience an amazing life if I'll just take good care of it. And I'm looking for others who believe the same thing. Mm -hmm. And so we have running clubs and hiking clubs and I'm going to be starting some, um, some exercise and fitness things once the weather breaks. And um, it's a little bit easier to do some of that stuff outside. And those are going to be ways that we can think of and be proactive to create an environment that's helpful for us, right? So <clears throat> here are some of the kind of intentional relationships that we need to build. <clears throat> Fellow travelers, that's kind of what I was just talking about. They're people that are on the same journey, beginning to develop the same kind of interest. They're moving in the same direction. We see ourselves as people moving toward common goals together. We're traveling together toward common goals. We need, to, we need to begin to put those relationships intentionally into our lives. Um, we can do that by finding others who are like-minded in that sense, but we can also do it by creating that kind of environment. Bring some friends together, and when you get together, talk about your health. Talk about the good recipes you're using. Talk about the new exercise you're doing. Talk about the fact that you're losing weight and, and see who else can come alongside, can get interested and say, I, I kind of want to make that a part of my life as well, right? How about role models? These are individuals that have reached some level of accomplishment. This may be an influencer on social media. Um, recently, I've been getting into calisthenic exercises. And so I've been watching these individuals who know what they're doing and know what they're talking about. And so these videos are motivating me and they're helping me. They're, they're teaching me. And so I'm creating relationships um, with role models. Obviously, it doesn't always have to be somebody like online or somebody you'll never meet, but sometimes it can be people that, um, that you see succeeding in life in the areas that you're interested in, 
and connecting with them. Of course, we talk about the coach relationship often. Um, I'm in a coaching role. Uh, Joy is now in a coaching role. All of us can be in a coaching role for each other. We can provide that kind of leadership and that kind of example and that kind of encouragement. Um, so we need people that will do that. And then the supporters are just those that maybe they're not into it with us. But again, going back to those who are friends, people who care about us enough to say, but if that's what you're into, I want to support you in that. I'm going to speak well of that. I'm going to encourage that. I want to help you get to your goals. And so I'm going to be willing to help you and assist you in any way that I can. So we need people who love us and respect us and want what's best for us. Um, and we need to nurture those relationships. All right. I was thinking about um, <clears throat> what it means to create that kind of environment. And actually, I thought about uh, 1 Thessalonians uh, 5, 4 through 9. It says this, um, uh, But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness, so that this day should surprise you like a thief. He's talking about the day when, when Christ returns. You are all children of the light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then, let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not disappoint us to suffer wrath, uh, did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this is obviously talking about our relationship with God, and I think that that's a really important concept. But the, the, the deeper principle is this idea that we have the opportunity to walk in light, not in darkness. And when, we, uh, when we're walking through life, whether, whether it's our faith that we're talking about, whether it's our physical health, walking in darkness means that we are not embracing what we know. We're not embracing the enlightenment. Instead, we're asleep to the dangers. We're asleep to the things that we um, know we should be more aware of and awake to. And, um, and we live in a world who's in many ways asleep to all of the things around them. And I'm, I'm just going to like, I don't even want to know the truth. I'm just going to keep moving forward doing what I want to do. But to walk in the light means that we're sober, we're aware, we're awake. We know what's right and we're engaging what's right. And that's what it takes to build the kind of environment around us that's going to help us walk in our faith and that's going to help us walk in our health. And obviously that's uh, what I believe is the right, most important thing for us and what I want to continue to encourage 